is both sides decide how much money they want. Or how much money, yeah, how much money they think they deserve. So usually the difference is, is this and this. That's usually the difference. Uh, so at that point, of course, they need to uh, negotiate. Uh, the reservation price is their, is their top price. And normally they're not going to get their top price. So, so they'll be saying something like, I want a million dollars. And then the other side will say, well, I, I will only pay you $50,000. And of course, they need to negotiate and, and bring bring those uh, those figures closer. Uh, if they ca can't uh, make a decision, then what will normally happen? They will bring in an arbitrator, and that arbitrator will decide how much it should be. Uh, so they will. So somebody says a million, the other says fifty thousand. Uh, then the one uh, group says nine hundred thousand, and the other the other people say, well, maybe fifteen hundred, a hundred fifty thousand. Uh, and then eventually they, they get between 7, 700,000 and uh, uh, 500,000. And then the, the arbit arbitrator will come in and they'll probably just put it right in the middle. That's usually the way it works. Why are we talking like this? Okay, we're talking about negotiation. <clears throat> um, if you've ever looked at, uh, uh, and there's really no reason why you should, uh, at uh, some of the, uh, the suits against uh, the president, uh, before he was president, of course, when he was a, uh, a, uh, a real estate mogul, uh, some of the suits against him, that's usually the way that they were settled. They were negotiated. They were settled out of court. And for that reason, he can say that he was never in, indicted, convicted. And usually these things, and, and especially with, uh, with uh, the president, uh, he usually makes all this stuff secret. So nobody can find out how much money he paid. Uh, and that's, that's part of uh, the contracts that he signs. Uh, that all of this stuff is, is, none of this stuff can be divulged. And of course, if they do divulge that information, then the, he can sue them. And that's, of course, another thing that he, he uh, threatens people with, with suit. In considering the merits of a case, uh, plaintiffs, uh, defendants, and attorneys are influenced by heuristics. Uh, it's a, uh, that, that means it's a psychological, it's a, heuristics in this case are psychological biases. Everybody has their own biases, and these are all psychologically based. These are heuristics. Uh, the self-serving bias occurs when people in interpret information or make decisions in ways that are consistent with their own interests, rather than an objective fashion, uh, in an objective fashion. For example, uh, parties often have difficulty seeing the merits of other side. There's a lot of people in here, and I want to uh, tell you that uh, the, the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, uh, I won't be here. Uh, I, th I put it in my sketch. I think I put it in my schedule. Well, anyway, I'm not going to be here on Wednesday. All right? I'll, I'll be driving to, to Iowa. Uh, so uh, it's not a secret, but just don't tell anyone. <laughs> <laughs> I probably, hardly anybody's going to be here on Wednesday, and I'm feeling guilty because I'm cheating you out of it. You can go Monday. Monday. I'm sorry? You can go Monday. I can go on Monday? Thank you. That's really nice of you. No, I'm, I'm going to leave after class on Tuesday. But uh, I won't be here on Wednesday, so. How many hours is that? What? Oh, you mean to, to Iowa? Uh, like 26? That's not bad. No, shoot, I can do that. It's just an extra two hours. Extra two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's about. I, I should get there Wednesday night, I hope, uh, or Thursday morning, whichever the case may be. I'm gonna have the dogs with me. I get to travel with my dogs. Uh, but there's only a week after we come back from Thanksgiving. That's something else that you need to think about. Uh, so if you have, uh, if you're a little bit behind uh, in uh, in your class. <laughs> You, you, uh, you, you'll only have a week after that. So potentially I'll come back and then I'll just drive right back because a week later I'll just go back to Iowa. I can grade all my stuff online, right? You guys won't need me to be here, will you? You, you will? When did you first? You, you need me? I'll, I'll stay until the 15th. Instead of leave on the 4th, I'll stay until the 15th. Uh, the anchoring and adjustment biases occurs when ne negotiators are strongly influenced. They're anchored by their initial starting value and do not sufficiently adjust their judgments 
uh, away from their starting point. And of course, this is a problem. This can potentially be a problem. The higher the first offer, the higher the ultimate settlement will be. Uh, of course, you've all seen those movies where uh, they were expecting a million dollars and they got $52 million since it's on the, it's on the board. Anyway. So normally what happens with that? Let me tell you a quick story. I'll tell you a quick story. Uh, when I was in the service, uh, this was in the 70s during the Vietnam War. Uh, I was in the service until 83. But uh, uh, when I was in the service, um, telephones were kind of interesting. You guys don't understand how telephones used to work. Uh, you, uh, they, <laughs> there were no cell phones. Only the military had cell phones. Uh, and they were huge. They were like bricks. Uh, and they weighed about as much as a brick, too. Uh, but uh, so in order to call somebody, you had to, uh, it was, everything was a landline. Uh, everything was long distance. Uh, so AT&T owned all the long distance lines. Uh, well, actually, they weren't AT&T, they were Bell Telephone at the time. So Bell Telephone owned all of the uh, long distance lines. Uh, one of the tricks that they pulled on, uh, just as a joke, uh, one of the tricks that they pulled on the United States military was that uh, the Bell Telephone didn't service any of the, the military bases. They didn't service any of the Army posts. They didn't service any of the Air Force bases. Uh, so they had to uh, create their own telephone system around the, the military bases. So if you're around a military base, potentially you had a uh, uh, telephone service that was not Bell Telephone. Okay. So what did that mean? What that meant was that uh, a long distance call from Chicago to uh, Phoenix cost, I don't know, a dollar a minute or whatever it, it cost, that's fine. But if you're on a military base, you had to pay to connect to Bell Telephone from the military base. So everything was a long distance call. So uh, there were no local calls. You could only call in your own uh, sphere. Uh, so if you called off of the base uh, and you called far enough away, like I'm from Indiana and I was living in Lubbock, Texas, and my wife had just left, so you know we're making all these telephone calls back and forth, everything was long distance. But it was, a, it was an extra charge. It was an extra long distance charge to go off the base and, and into the Bell Telephone system. So they charged us to make that connection. If we had just been a Bell Telephone system, we would only have paid one charge. But because we were on a military base, we had to pay two charges, at least two charges. Sometimes it was three charges, sometimes it was four charges. It was, it was, a, a, it was funny to get your, your telephone bill. Uh, people, if you were in the military, you hardly ever made any telephone calls, any long distance, because everything was long distance. So you couldn't call your parents, you couldn't call your girlfriend back home, you couldn't call, you know, you couldn't call your friends up on the telephone. It was too expensive, and you could only stay on the tele on the uh, the phone for a couple minutes because it was so expensive, and you're paying five, ten, fifteen dollars for every telephone call if you're in the military. So somebody finally sued Bell Telephone. This is back in the 70s. I had a telephone bill of $1,500 one month. And I made about $5,000 a year. <laughs> and I had a, a telephone bill of $1,500. <sighs> now the way the military works, if you have a bill that you have you haven't paid, they will garnish you your wages. They will take, they will garnish your wages and they will just take it automatically out of your wages. And they will negotiate with whatever the company is, Bell Telephone, and for $1,500 they'll spread it, you know, $100 a month. And I'm only making, I don't know, four or $500 a month anyway. And here they're taking $100 out of my paycheck. Okay, so somebody sued Bell Telephone. I was part of the suit. Well, I, there were like seven... 7,500 uh, military people that were part of the suit. And of course we won. Of course we won. I mean, it's ridiculous for Bell Telephone to be charging you all these extra charges, all these connection charges. They, could, they charged you money for an automatic connection. I mean, it, they didn't have to do anything. It's not like somebody had to take one of those things and stick it in the, up the wall. It was an automatic connection. 
It was almost instantaneous, yet they're charging you 50 cents an, a minute for that connection. So if I called home, if I called my parents back in Indiana from Lubbock, Texas, it's like $3.50 a minute if I needed to talk to my parents. So what I normally would do, I would call them and say, can you call me back? Well, my dad would call me back, but my mom never would. <laughs> my mom was funny. So she wasn't really used to the long distance telephone. <laughs> so later on, after Bell Telephone broke up, and this is one of the reasons why Bell Telephone had to break up, they split them because it was a monopoly. And they had to, they, they split them up and then they became, they became AT&T. There used to be Bell South and, and uh, uh, Bell West and uh, <laughs> Bell Telephone in, in the Midwest. And then Bell East was in, uh, in New York. Anyway. Uh, so they broke them up, but my mother it was really kind of funny because she would always uh, uh, call me on she'd call me on the phone or I would call her and then we would talk for for like two hours and then she'd say, "Oh, well, tell me how much this telephone call costs, and I'll send you the money yeah like she'd ever send me any, any money <laughs> anyway that's my mom she had all the money in the world and she could never pay for a telephone call anyway, so they lost the suit they lost the suit and this is in 1975 they lost the suit. Uh, so what happened with all those 75, 100 people that, uh, that sued Bell, Te Bell Telephone? Did we get money? Did we get paid back? That's all we wanted. We just wanted our money back. We thought we were being ripped off. And the courts agreed with us. And we won. So what happened next? Settled. They didn't settle. I'm sorry? <laughs> no, no, no. That would have been nice. Anything would have been nice, but that's not what happened. They used the money for something else? What did Bell Telephone do instead of pay us our, the money that, that they owed us? Ended the contract. Well, they broke up for one thing. Yeah, they ended their contract. They, they ended their company is what they did. So now the company that we, that we sued that no longer exists. But they still owe us the money, right? It's still in appeals. 45 years later, it's still in appeals. Did you know there are a company up in um, Canada, Bell, Com Bell Telephone Company, and there's a cell phone company too. Oh, is that right? Mm -hmm. Up in Canada, huh? They're hiding. That's why to this day I will not use Bell Telephone. They still owe me that money but that I will never get back. Bastards. <laughs> okay, and they can do this. They can do this. You can string this thing out as long as you want. As long as you're willing to pay the lawyers, as, as long as you're willing to, to file the, the appeals, you can string this thing out forever. And that's exactly what Bell Telephone is doing, even though they don't exist anymore. It's the, the companies that they splintered into. Uh, those companies are, are, are still in appeals. Will I ever get the money? Well, I don't care now. Out of the 7,500 people, probably half of us are dead. Probably, I'm guessing. I'm old. I'm, I'm, I was like 25 years old. I needed the money then. My wife kept calling me collect. And she was drunk. And she'd call me collect. And she would tell me what a jackass I was. You know how I'm saying. Tell me what a son of a bitch I was. For a half an hour. And I couldn't convince her to get off the phone. Because you, you can't hang up. If she calls you collect, that connection is made. And one person can't disconnect. Both of them has, have to disconnect in order for it to, to go off. If the other person just leaves the phone off the hook, it's still a connection. And you're still paying for it. That's the old days. Now you guys have cell phones. I don't even understand cell so. Anyway, so that you can do that. And my point is, and the reason I told you this story is because you can appeal all of this stuff and you can draw this thing out for an extended length of time. That's what happened with my daughter this summer. The, her, the father of her child threatened to, to, to uh, take it to court. And then he, he threatened to, to go to appeals. He'll say, you'll never be done with this. You'll be paying for this for the rest of your life. And the reason he could say that is because his family has lots and lots of money. And they've got a, a lawyer on retainer. 
In other words, they pay him whether he does anything or not. And this would have given him something to do. Isn't that great? Uh, and he could have strung it out for an extended length of time. But luckily, uh, the negotiator uh, convinced him not to do that. <laughs> and now everything is settled. And now we're okay. Okay, so we're talking about settlements in civil cases. Uh, Miller and uh, Boster in 1977 have identified three images of, of the trial. Uh, the trial is a search for truth. That makes sense. I mean, that's the way we think of it. As, as good Americans, we think that anytime you go to, to trial, you're looking for truth. Justice in the American way. That's Superman, right? Truth, justice in the American way. It assumes that truth can be ascertained, uh, that it will emerge from confrontation uh, of the conflicting facts. So if we put all the facts together, we're going to come up with the truth. And of course, that's one of the, the ways, that's one of the reasons that we hold a trial. It's all, it also assumes that judges or jurors can put aside their prejudices and decide the case with th this passionate analysis of the arguments and evidence. Of course, if you're a minority, are you going to get a fair trial? Are you? I don't know. I don't know. It all depends. It can be difficult to uh, meet this ideal, of course, uh, the, the fact that you're looking for the truth. It's difficult to, to do away with prejudices. Uh, back in the 1950s, uh, during Jim Crow down in the South, if you were black and you, were, uh, and you went to trial, the probability is that you'd go to jail, no matter what your crime was, uh, because you were black. And it, it had to do with prejudice courts and prejudice judges. Uh, there is a movie out now called uh, Hidden Figures. It's about uh, the women that helped with the uh, uh, NASA, NASA. NASA. They were mathematicians. And uh, at one point, she, uh, one of the individuals wanted to be an engineer, and she went to court. She couldn't go, uh, go to a segregated school, but the only classes in engineering were being taught at a white school, a segregated school. So she had to go to court to get the judge to agree to allow her to go to, to classes at, uh, at the local high school, Hampton High School, uh, and because they were segregated, and she had to get him to agree to do it. That's the way that they were treated. So potentially, uh, she did get justice because she was allowed to go to, uh, to, the, to those classes, but because it was a segregated school, it was difficult for her to get permission to do that. Okay, so minorities sometimes have a difficult time finding uh, juries and, and judges who are not prejudiced against one thing or another. Uh, we do know that white people uh, obviously have a problem with black males, especially black males. Black people in general, but black males uh, specifically. Um, it seems to be white policemen that are shooting black males. Almost exclusively. <clears throat> the one guy was in his car with his wife, and he still got shot and killed. He had his kid in the back seat, and he still got shot and killed. Uh, okay, so first of all, we're looking for the truth. Uh, the trial is a test of credibility. Uh, it acknowledges the facts and evidence are in incomplete and biased. A uh, judge or jury must weigh and evaluate the truthfulness of the opposing sources. Unfortunately, both judges and jurors can make unwarranted inferences. And of course, so we're looking for the credibility of the witnesses. We're looking for the credibility of the defendant. Uh, the third thing is the trial is a conflict resolving ritual. It provides a mechanism to resolve controversies uh, to create the sense of justice that, the, uh, that justice is being done. And of course, we're resolving, trying to resolve conflicts. Two people that don't agree with one another. Which one is correct? That's the question. Preliminary actions, the first thing that happens in a uh, court case is uh, the preliminary actions. Uh, the first thing uh, that they talk about is discovery. Discovery has to do with the, it's the process by which each side tries to gain vital information. Uh, they're looking for police records or trying to gain any information that they can that uh, deals with evidence in the case. Uh, so the prosecution has to tell the d defense what evidence they have against their client, um, against the client, that client, that select client. And this is known as discovery. 
Prosecution has to give them all this information. They have to give them all the information that they have. Now normally what happens, and if you've ever watched these, uh, these uh, lawyer cases uh, on television, one of the things that happens is that the prosecution will, will uh, t talk to the witnesses, and then the defense will talk to the witnesses. And each one, of course, will theoretically gets exactly the same information. But they inter may interpret it differently, and of course that's what they're looking for. The uh, defense is looking for uh, uh, information that will exonerate their client, or can be s seen as positive as far as their client is concerned. Uh, and this is all done in discovery. So they can't uh, come up with new evidence right at the, in the middle of the trial. Uh, a lot of times what will happen is if new evidence comes in, uh, is presented, the judge gets to decide whether that evidence will, uh, will be allowed in court. If it's uh, evidence that will uh, convict the uh, defendant, of course the defense attorney will try to stop that evidence from being allowed. Uh, and if it is something that exonerates the uh, defendant, then uh, the defense tries to get the, the judge to accept the evidence uh, in, in the case. The judge doesn't have to. New evidence he doesn't have to accept. He can just try the case with the, the old evidence. And if new evidence comes in, he can, he can reject it if he wants to. It's all up to the judge. Uh, what are we doing? Okay. <clears throat> um, preliminary actions, uh, draw a panel of prospective jurors. Uh, this is called a venire. Uh, it's, uh, it's from a large list. Usually it's based on voter registration lists and lists of li licensed <clears throat> drivers. As I told you last time, I've been on juries, I've been called for jury duty a dozen times uh, in the various places where I've been. Normally I'm not, I don't live any place long enough to, uh, to uh, serve on, on a jury. Uh, but I was up in Montana for 10 years, uh, so I was called to, to jury duty several times while I was up there. I haven't been called here. I don't know if I would be called here. Would I? I live on the reservation, so would I be called for jury duty? I'm a white guy on, on the reservation. Would you I? would have to register down at your local chapter house to vote. But you wouldn't get to vote in the tribal elections, oh. just the um, oh. just the state, yeah. I so vote in that's Iowa. That's what I do. I vote in Iowa. So. But you're not a um, citizen of Iowa. I am. I own property in Iowa. No, I was kidding. <laughs> All my cars are registered in Iowa. Oh, okay. <laughs> I have an Arizona driver's license. How confusing is that? With the ugliest picture you ever saw. I do not look like the picture on my driver's license. If I use it, I don't use it as identification. Because the guy in that picture, on that driver's license, has to be the god ugliest guy. When does your license expire? Uh, I don't know, five years or so, I hope. I don't know. <laughs> oh, it is the ugly picture. And my, my Iowa driver's license, it wasn't a bad picture. But this one is just horrible. Oh my god, I don't really look like that. <laughs> I took a really good picture for my passport, so that's the, that's the picture I want to use, but uh, this one makes me look like I'm like 500 years old. I'm some kind of a strange vampire. vampire exactly. <laughs> okay, so we, so we impanel a, a jury. Uh, we haven't impaneled them yet. We, what we have is a list. And usually, uh, if they're looking for, well, they're looking for 12 people, uh, usually they will have a list of about 100. Um, and of, of course, I've never been actually, uh, I've never sat on a jury. And one of the reasons I haven't sat on a jury is because uh, all the cases that I would have sat for uh, were negotiated. Uh, so they were plea bargained. Once a venere uh, for a trial has been selected, a process known as Voir dire is uh, employed to question and select the eventual jurors. Uh, if you watch Bull, and I don't know if anybody's seen this television show, it's about, uh, it's about uh, Dr. Phil. Doctor, that's what Dr. Phil did before he became famous. You know how he became famous? He helped uh, Oprah on a case, so she started calling him in uh, to her show, and then he became famous. Now he's a multi-millionaire, of course. 
Uh, but that's what he used to do. And if you watch that television show, that's, this is primarily what the show is about, is about seating a jury that will be um, uh, whoever he's working for. Uh, they will seat a jury that uh, uh, will, will agree with his client. And of course, he always wins. In the television show, he always wins. I haven't quite figured that one out yet. Does anybody always win? Opening statements. Uh, the lawyers for each side are permitted to make opening statements. Um, this, <laughs> they don't, they're not giving evidence at this point. Uh, they're just overviews of the evidence that will be presented in the, in the trial. The prosecution or the plaintiff usually goes first. So first the prosecution goes. And then the defense uh, attorney is allowed to speak. The defense opening uh, follows immediately after, or the defense can uh, choose to wait until it is their turn to present evidence. Now, one of the things you have to remember is almost all trials are run by the state or the county in a select state. And so the laws that, that uh, uh, control uh, what happens in a trial has to do with the laws of that state. And we have 50 different states. Well, actually, we have 50, 50 plus the District of Columbia. Uh, so as long as, so you have to follow those laws. And sometimes these aren't, aren't exactly the same. Uh, sometimes the defense has to uh, make an opening statement. Uh, in some states, they do. In some states, they're allowed to uh, waive this until they, uh, they start presenting their own evidence. And then, then at that stage, uh, they will make their opening statement. Sometimes in, in select states, uh, they won't say anything until the prosecution has completed their case, and then they will present their case. Uh, so they won't say anything at all until, uh, until their uh, defense starts. After opening statements, uh, the prosecutor or plaintiff calls its witnesses. Uh, each witness testifies under oath with the threat of a charge of perjury if the witness fails to, uh, uh, to tell the truth. Uh, each witness undergoes direct examination, cross-examination, redirect, and recross. In other words, um, if it's a prosecution witness, then he will examine that, uh, that witness. Then the defense attorney will cross-examine that witness. Uh, then the uh, uh, prosecuting attorney will redirect. He will... Um, because a lot of times what the, the defense attorney is trying to do, he's trying to confuse things. So then the uh, prosecuting attorney will redirect. In other words, he will try to bring out the same points that he was talking about before. And then the last thing that will happen is recross. So they get to talk to each witness four times. They get a, a it's the prosecution, or if it's a defense witness, of course, the defense attorney will uh, speak to them first. So they have the direct examination, the cross-examination, the redirect, and the recross. If you've ever been in a trial, uh, usually uh, you'll get to talk to each lawyer twice, which is a lot of fun. <laughs> After the prosecution or plaintiff's attorneys have presented all their witnesses, it is the defense's turn. Each witness undergoes direct examination, cross-examination, redirect, and recross, uh, so everybody is, gets to talk to each lawyer twice one right after the other. <clears throat> after both sides have presented their witnesses, uh, one or both uh, may decide to ask the judge for permission to present rebuttal evidence, uh, which uh, uh, attempts to counteract or disprove evidence given by an earlier witness. So the rebuttal evidence uh, is, is at the end of the trial. Uh, the uh, the uh, prosecuting attorney will present their case and their witnesses the defense attorney will present their case, their witnesses, and then they will have, if the, the judge allows it, they will have rebuttal evidence. So if they have an expert, they will bring in, they can bring in a rebuttal witness. And at that stage, of course, they will, uh, they will try to uh, convince the jury that uh, what the first guy said uh, isn't exactly accurate. It usually has to do with uh, expert testimony. The rebuttal evidence uh, is usually uh, deals with uh, expert uh, testimony. Uh, once all the evidence has been presented, each side is permitted uh, to make a closing argument, and this is known as a summation. 
Uh, typically, the prosecution or the plaintiff gets the first summation, uh, followed by the defense, after which the prosecution or plaintiff responds. In other words, you have the uh, prosecuting attorney uh, initially, and he makes his closing statement. The defense attorney makes his closing statement, and then the prosecuting attorney, unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know, he gets to, to uh, speak to the jury last. Uh, so he is the last attorney that will get to, to speak. So the defense attorney only gets to, to speak to the jury once, as far as the summation is concerned. But uh, the prosecuting attorney gets to talk to them twice. The first step in the jury trial is for the judge to give instructions to the jury. But it's not the same in all states. In some states, instructions precede the closing arguments. So he tells them what the laws are, what laws they're, they're, they're uh, supposed to be using to make their, their judgments. Uh, the judge informs the jury of the relevant laws, of course, and that's what I just said. Uh, what laws are intact in this case. Uh, murder or robbery, what is a felony, what is a, a misdemeanor, uh, you know, those kinds of things. He will, uh, the, the judge will explain, he or she will explain uh, what laws they're supposed to be dealing with. The judge also instructs jurors about the standard that they should use to weigh the evidence. Uh, with criminal charges, the jurors must be convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is guilty before they vote to convict. Reasonable doubt. Uh, I was watching Bull last night, as a matter of fact, and it was about, oh, this was weird, it was about, about a, 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 a case on an Indian reservation in upstate New York, the Nawaki, I've never heard of the Nawaki, but I'm not exactly sure they exist, uh, but the lady that was in charge, the chief of the tribe was the, uh, was the, the uh, chief judge, uh, and she, uh, her last name was Saucy. T-S-O-S-I-E. Uh, and one of the people on the jury's name was Yazi, which I found kind of curious. I know, wait a minute, this is Upper New York State. How many Athabascan-speaking people are there up in Upper New York State? Evidently, they just took Indian names, common Indian names, and, and gave them to these Algonquian-speaking people up in Upper New York State. Kind of was it really saucy? Or was saucy. It, it was T S O S I E. They had her name right in front of the uh, <coughs> plaque. She had a plaque in front of her on her desk that said uh, Chief Saucy. T S O S I E. And one of the defendants' names was Yazi. But you know that saucy is saucy, right? That's they pronounce it saucy. Yeah, that's wrong. I'm sorry, it was bull, it was a television show from California, and that's the way they pronounce it. Saucy and Yazzie. Yazzie. I can't remember what the defendant's last name was. I just went, wait a minute, that's a Navajo name, that's not right. Anyway. Oh, oh but the point was that uh, uh, on... On their reservation, it didn't have to be a reason, it, reasonable doubt didn't, uh, didn't weigh in. If, if uh, they could convict the guy, if uh, it seemed logical that he might have been the one. So there, it, was, it didn't have anything to do with reasonable doubt. It had to do with whether you thought maybe he did it or not. That was their law. I know, it was really kind of interesting. So it didn't have anything to do with reasonable doubt. I told you that my brother was on, uh, on a jury uh, for a murder trial. This guy had shot his wife and killed her, shot her in the face. Um, and what, let's see, how did this work? They were, they were trying to convict him of first degree murder. Well, that's what the prosecution was trying to do. And what had happened, they had been in a fight. The husband and wife had been in a fight. And she had drawn the gun on him and she chased him throughout the house and shot at him a couple times and missed him. Uh, he had somehow wrestled the gun from her uh, and uh, she came at him with a knife. She gr went into the kitchen, grabbed a knife, and when she came back out, uh, she attacked him with the knife. She was coming at him like this, and when he raised the gun, it went off. That's what he said. When he raised the gun, it went off. And he shot her in the face and killed her. So they were trying to charge him with first-degree murder. And my brother was on the jury. 
and uh, so it went it went to the jury you know they were trying to decide and uh, my brother retried the case he was the he wasn't the jury foreman but he was the person trying to argue uh, that first degree murder didn't make any sense in this case because for one thing she was attacking him so it uh, it was uh, manslaughter is what he wanted what he wanted the, it to be but what he said was when she was squeezing off rounds, it was a gun that had a really tight trigger. So when she was squeezing off rounds, she had uh, she was about to squeeze off another round when he disarmed her. So she had pulled the trigger halfway, and then when he when he grabbed it and put his finger on the trigger, it went off. That's that's what my brother said. And of course, it was it was an, it was a Saturday night Saturday night thirty two thirty eight special. I'm sorry, it was a thirty eight. Uh, 38 special. Uh, it was not really made very well. It had never really been fired before. Uh, so the trigger was kind of stiff. Yeah, so when she, and anyway, that's, so the, the uh, manslaughter was not uh, one of the instructions that they were given. But the jury came back and said, we find the defendant guilty, but not of, of first degree murder. And at that stage, the, 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 uh, a uh, judge said, well, what, what do you suggest? And they said manslaughter. So uh, he went to jail for, I don't know, 10 or 15 years or something. Was it involuntary manslaughter? Inval involuntary manslaughter. So that's what they did. But of course, Indiana is different from other states. It was in the state of Indiana. My brother had a great time, just a great time. He wants to be on more juries. <laughs> but now that he was on this jury, they won't sit him on another jury, especially a murder trial, because he tries to retry the case for the lawyers. They were all pissed off. The judge wasn't real happy about it either because that wasn't, you know, he, he was trying to get the, the uh, case uh, finalized. And of course they had to, to not really redo the trial, uh, but uh, rewrite uh, practically the entire thing. It's really kind of strange. My brother said, do So what are we talking about? Okay, reasonable doubt. <clears throat> um, the, the defendant is guilty before they would uh, to convict. Uh, okay, so it has to be a reasonable doubt. In a civil trial, the preponderance of evidence is necessary for a finding in favor of one side. And of course, if you've ever watched these things on television and they're suing somebody for uh, contaminating uh, an environment like the uh, Aaron Brockovich case, case uh, where the uh, uh, energy company was uh, creating a, a toxic environment and people were dying of leukemia. Uh, she had to prove without, with uh, a preponderance of evidence that it was these individuals uh, did it. Not only did they do it, but also that they knew that it was happening. That's what she had to prove. And of course she was successful and they got a, uh, a settlement of, I don't know, $157 million or something. Erin Brockovich. And she's still out there someplace looking for other cases to uh, to uh, deal with. Uh, when the jury has reached its verdict, its foreperson uh, informs the bailiff, who informs the judge, who reconvenes the attorneys and the defendants, and uh, the plaintiffs in a civil trial. They are plaintiffs, not defendants, in a civil trial for an announcement of the verdict, and of course, then they announce the verdict. Advantages of the prosecution. Uh, the prosecution is first to address the judge and jury. Uh, it has uh, full resources of the government. Uh, so if it's the state or the county or the federal government, of course they have all the money that they can. Uh, they can use all the money from the uh, from the government. Uh, the prosecution presents its evidence before the defense does. Uh, at the end of the trial, the prosecution gets to go first and also gets a chance to offer a final rebuttal to the defense's closing argument. So the prosecution looks like they have a huge advantage. They got all the money in the world from the government. Uh, they get to present their evidence first, and then they get to close uh, first, and then they also get to rebut whatever the defense says. So it looks like the prosecution has a really serious advantage. However, there are advantages for the defense. They do not bear the burden of proof. In other words, the prosecution has to prove that this is exactly what happened. The def defense doesn't have to do that. Hello? Sorry. 
Only two people have my telephone number. My wife and my, <laughs> three people, my wife, my son, and my daughter. And that was not either my wife, my son, or my daughter. It was Elizabeth. She wanted to talk to me about something else. How did she get my telephone number? It was probably the next one on the list. Right? Because nobody else has my telephone number. Oh, Marius has my telephone number. Maybe Sarah's got my telephone number. But neither one of them are named Elizabeth, right? <laughs> okay, so the defense does not have to prove anything. All the defense has to do is show that the evidence presented by the prosecution is inaccurate. They don't have the burden of proof. They don't have to prove that their, their, that their uh, um, a client is, is innocent. All they have to prove is that the prosecution is incorrect. That's all they have to prove. They don't, have to, they don't have to say that their client is innocent. And this is one of the ways that, uh, that lawyers can uh, work with a guilty party. Because they don't have to prove innocence. They may know that, that they aren't innocent. But it's the job of the prosecution to show that they are guilty. And all they have to do is, uh, is rebut the, uh, the uh, evidence that is, is being presented by the prosecution. Does that make sense? So they don't have to prove that the guy is innocent. And that's easier than, than proving that the guy is guilty. The prosecution must turn over exculpatory evidence. In other words, they know exactly what they're going to say. One of the things that, that uh, they say about lawyers is they don't ask a question unless they know what the answer is. So on the, if somebody is sitting, is on the stand, they know exactly what that person is going to say. It's not like they're telling them what to say, but they know what the evidence is. They know what they have said before. They always know. So they never ask a question that they don't know the answer to. Uh, the defense may uh, have uh, more opportunities than the prosecution to remove potential jurors without giving a reason. It all depends on the state. In some states, they can remove any, any juror that they want to. They don't have a select number. In other states, like in the state of California, each side has a select number of, uh, of people that they can uh, exclude from the jury. And of course, in New York State, it's the same way. So if you watch Bull, my wife watches Bull. I don't really like the show, but it had, it had Indians on it last night. So I thought I'd watch it last night. <laughs> the guy was uh, innocent. He was innocent. So every, everything's fine. He was uh, Bull's uh, roommate in college. This, this native guy. Okay, anyway. Uh, so what's going on? Okay, so in the state of New York, you only have a select number of, of individuals that you can remove from the jury as a defendant. But in some states, they uh, have an unlimited number of uh, exclusions that they can use. Defendants uh, do not uh, have to take the stand as witnesses on their own behalf. Uh, that's their Fifth Amendment right. They don't have to testify. And of course, they, if they do go on, on, uh, on, on the stand, um, they don't have to prove that they're innocent. All they have to prove is that the, the prosecution is incorrect. Or that they haven't proven that this guy is guilty. Defendants who are found not guilty can never be tried again for that specific crime. So if somebody is tried for murder and they are exonerated, and it comes out late, they can talk all they want about whether they killed the guy or not. And this is one of the things that they were looking for with uh, uh, O.J. Simpson. He wrote a book uh, about six years ago, seven years ago. Uh, and they thought that he was going to admit that he killed, that he actually did the, the murder. If he did the murder, it doesn't make any difference. He cannot be retried for that crime. His problem is that uh, uh, they, took, they had a civil case after he uh, uh, was acquitted for murder of Ronald Goldman and uh, uh, the, uh, his ex-wife, uh, and they won. So uh, they have garnished all of the money that he can he makes off of off of anything. They took his Heisman Trophy and they pawned, they didn't pawn it, but they sold it. They auctioned it off, and all that money went to the Goldman family because they won the civil civil case. Uh, so, so, so even if the, you say the person you have tried in the civil courts, and they're found not guilty. But then civil case doesn't find guilt or innocence. What is this 
civil case? A civil court will um, uh, find that, uh, uh, let me use an example. Um, in the South, one of the problems in the South uh, that the uh, that people were having was that uh, <coughs> the judges were all white and the juries were all white. So if you were African American, you couldn't get a, a good, uh, you couldn't get a, a, a a reasonable um, decision on, on, as far as that is concerned. Uh, however, what the federal government did, they, they went in and they, they sued the state for uh, uh, impinging on people's civil rights. And that was a civil case, it wasn't a criminal case. In a criminal case, you, you get either guilty or innocent. Uh, but in a civil case, you get a settlement. And the settlement has to do with how much money one person has to pay to the other. Now, what is what's your other? I'm sorry. I, so, like, I, so it's a civil case, but then it turns into a criminal case. N not usually. It's usually the other way around. A criminal case is they they try uh, they take them to court and try to uh, prosecute them as a criminal. If they lose that case, then they can take it to civil civil court. Trying to get uh, remuneration, trying to trying to get money for, for what happens, trying to get a settlement. Because I know a case where this went straight to criminal courts, and okay. now it's becoming. All right, went straight to civil court. Went straight to civil court, and then they found them guilty. No, uh, it's not guilty. Not settled but, yet. Oh, it's not it's settled not. yet, and then it went to criminal court. Yeah, it's like our, like it's being considered as criminal. Okay. So, so he committed a crime. Somebody committed a crime. And they sued them. That's what a civil court is. Mm -hmm. okay. They sued them for something. And when they settled, they admitted that they did something wrong, so that they had to pay. Or it hasn't been settled yet. Been settled. Okay. And now they've decided that they actually broke the law, so now there's a criminal case against them. Yeah. Okay. Usually it's the other way around, but that's I guess it's possible to do it the other way. The other way. Okay. okay. Fascinating. Isn't that fascinating? Yeah. It really all depends on the state. All the states have different laws. <clears throat> A lot of the states have similar laws. So in this state you can do that, but in other states you can't do that. It has to go through criminal. It has to go through the cr criminal courts first before it goes through the civil courts. Yes, California is that way. Yes, sir. I was just going to ask, um, is this also considered double jeopardy? What, you mean the civil case? Mm -hmm. No, it's two different two different cases. Mm -hmm. One is looking for, uh, uh, trying to determine whether you're a criminal or not, mm -hmm. and the other is trying to, to determine if you're um, financially liable mm -hmm. or not. And that's what they decided in the Golden case. So he was retried, and they determined that he had, the settlement had to do with uh, O.J. paying the Goldman family, I don't know, $56 million or something. Okay. But they can't retry the criminal case. So he's exonerated. He can never be, nothing can ever happen to him. Of course, he was arrested for robbing somebody up in Las Vegas. And now he's out. He just got out like a couple weeks ago. I know this is all exciting. <laughs> Basically, when we're talking about a football player, well, remember um, uh, uh, Hernandez, Aaron Hernandez? Yeah, Aaron Hernandez uh, used to play for the Patriots. Uh, he was charged with murder. And, of course, he went to court. Actually, he was tried for three murders, and he was convicted for one. And he got life, a life sentence for the one murder. But uh, he was actually tried for three different murders, and uh, he was only convicted for the one. And now he's committed suicide. So, hung himself in his. So it was suicide. Yeah, it was suicide. Oh, you think somebody murdered him? Yeah. Oh, okay. The rope. With a rope? <laughs> Not the rope. Did. <laughs> the rope murdered him. Okay. <laughs> okay, so the defense has a pretty good situation. They don't have to prove anything. All they have to prove is that the, the prosecution is incorrect. That's all they have to prove. And this is one of the reasons why, you know, we talk about evidence all the, all the time and how much evidence they have against them. Uh, in the case of, of O.J., the evidence was fairly circumstantial. 
Uh, there were, there, they didn't have any DNA. Uh, they had a uh, glove, uh, but there was no DNA in the glove or on the glove. Um, there was a knife that somebody found, but it didn't have his fingerprints on it. Uh, you know, they, most of the evidence was fairly superficial, uh, circumstantial, I'm sorry, and superficial as well. Uh, so they really couldn't prove that he was the one that did it. That was the problem. Of course, everybody thought that he did because he was such a jealous person, I guess. I don't know. I don't know. You can believe either way you want. He was certainly exonerated for that. But he was convicted for robbing the, the people in uh, Las Vegas. As confusing as all that is. So the defense, all the defense has to do is prove that the prosecution doesn't have enough evidence to convict. And of course, that's one of the reasons why the police are, are uh, tasked with finding enough evidence that it can be a, a uh, lockdown uh, prosecution. Uh, they, can, they can prosecute the guy without any problems at all. They have an eyewitness, they have uh, DNA evidence, they have fingerprint evidence, they have something. They must have something uh, in order to uh, convict. And this can be a problem. Um, maybe everybody knows who did it. But there's no evidence to show that they did. But everybody knows that, that, that they did it. So, you know, knowing that somebody did it means nothing. Having the evidence is everything. So if they have his fingerprints on a uh, shell that uh, was used to, uh, to shoot somebody, then potentially that's evidence, of course. You've got to have the evidence or there's nothing you can do about it. You have to let them go. That's just the way it works. <clears throat> so if the guy's a really good criminal and never leaves any evidence, now we've got a problem. We can never, there's nothing we can do about it. despite the fact that everybody knows, knows that he did it. If the, defendant is a, uh, if the defendant in a criminal trial is judged guilty, a punishment must be decided. In most jurisdictions, the trial judge decides punishment. Uh, in the, the case of my, my brother, uh, since they wouldn't convict him of first degree murder, they had to convict him of second degree murder. But they couldn't decide how long they were going to send him to jail. The judge was pissed, the prosecution was pissed, and they, they moved uh, to give him a maximum sentence, and that's exactly what happened. So despite the fact that they, they uh, convicted him of uh, involuntary manslaughter, the judge threw the book at him, and they put him in jail for 35 years. It was like 15 to 35 or something. Uh, he could have done a lot of different things. He could have put him on probation. He could have uh, uh, allowed him to... Uh, be paroled uh, with time served. Of course, he had been in jail for a year and a half. But they could have, uh, they could have uh, uh, given him that sentence. So it really all depends on the, the jurisdiction that we're dealing with. In 2004 decision, the United States Supreme Court ruled that judges may not uh, uh, increase defendant's sentences on the basis of what they perceive as aggravating factors. In other words, if it's a heinous crime, uh, rape and murder or something. Uh, they, can't, uh, they can't give them uh, uh, more time than uh, what the law tells them they can give them. Uh, 10 to 15 or 15 to 20 or whatever. Uh, you can't uh, execute somebody uh, for rape. There are, are no states where rape is, is a capital crime. So you can't execute somebody just because they raped somebody. Um, in the Blakely versus Washington in 2004, the court reserved those determinations for juries. In other words, you have to go back to the jury and ask them uh, for a decision if you want to expand uh, the amount of time that the individual spends in, uh, in jail. It's not up to the judge, it's up to the jury. And that is in select cases, of course, in se select states. It all depends on, their, on the state. In a handful of states, sentencing is determined by a jury. Uh, that's the way it is in Arizona. The jury decides what kind, what, how long the person's going to spend in jail or whether they're going to be executed. In cases involving the death penalty, jurors rather than the judges decide the sentence. Uh, this is Ring versus Arizona. This is, that it actually is a picture of Ring. I don't know this case. Uh, 2002 evidently murdered somebody and uh, I'm not sure whether he's on death row or not. I don't know. Does Arizona have, have a death row? 
Do you guys execute? Does anybody know? I don't know either. I'm not sure. Maybe we should find out. Anyway. He's, uh, that is actually a ring, and he murdered, evidently he murdered somebody, and the jury decided whether he would be executed or, or uh, go to jail. Uh, you can put somebody in jail uh, for life, uh, which usually means they can be paroled in, depending on the state, uh, 25 to 35 years, uh, but you can give somebody uh, life imprisonment without possibility of parole. Somebody just got uh, sentenced with that. Somebody was charged with uh, three counts of murder, and they got three life sentences, and because it was more than one life sentence, it's a life sentence without possibility of parole. So they will spend the rest of their lives in jail. Any defendant uh, has the opportunity to appeal a verdict to a higher level of courts. Appeals are also possible in virtually every civil suit. Uh, and this is one of this is what AT not AT and T. This is what Bell Telephone has been doing. They can they can draw this thing out forever. They will never have to pay that money. And now I don't care. But I, but one of the things that is the offshoot of that is that I will never ever use Bell Telephone or AT and T in the future. I don't give a holy hell what what kind of a wonderful deal they have. And they're always calling me up on the telephone and telling me, oh, you need to switch carriers because we have this wonderful deal. This was up in Montana where AT&T doesn't even service Montana. They've never serviced Montana. And here they're calling me on the telephone in Montana telling me I need to switch my carrier from Sprint to AT&T or whatever. Anyway. How stupid are they? They were going to give me $200 to change my carrier. They already owe me that $200 from my long distance calls from. Your, yeah. Late night calls. I know. <laughs> my drunk wife. Ex wife. Did I say wife? She was my ex wife. Yeah. Uh, for an appeal, the appellate uh, judges read uh, the record, the transcript of trial proceedings. Uh, the, the pleadings, the motions and, the, uh, that, and accompanying documents filled by the attorneys, filed by the attorneys. The briefs, uh, written arguments for both sides about the issues on appeal, and then they decide whether to overturn the original trial decision or to let it stand. And of course, this, you, if you've uh, ever watched a television show or a movie that dealt with the death penalty, of course, they're always in appeals, and this is the process that it goes through. And this is one of the reasons why if somebody is convicted of murder and they are sentenced to die, uh, it's one of the reasons why it takes 11, 12, 15, 17 years to execute this person. Because it has to go through this whole appeal process. And it starts out at the state appeals uh, court, then it goes to the, the uh, federal appeals, then it can potentially go to the Supreme Court, potentially it can go to the Supreme Court. And of course, it takes a long time to write all these briefs. And they give them as an exact, uh, they give them a specific amount of time uh, that they have to make these appeals. Uh, up to five years, they can, they can appeal their uh, sentencing or whatever. It all depends on the state. Like I said, it all depends, everything depends on the state. Appellate judges rarely reverse a verdict. Uh, on the basis of the facts of the case or the apparent legitimacy of that verdict. In other words, they're not looking at the case, trying to decide whether the case was uh, tried correctly or not. That's not right. They're, uh, whether the evidence points in that direction. That's not really what they're trying to do. They're trying to make sure that all the procedures that were supposed to be followed were followed correctly. That's what they're trying to do. So if you're going to win on appeals, you're not going to win because of the evidence. Doesn't have anything to do with the witnesses. Nothing at all. Has to do with whether the trial was, was conducted correctly. That's, ex that's the only thing that they can look at. When they do reverse it, it's usually because they believe that the trial judge made a procedural error such as allowing controversial evidence to be presented. So there has to be a reason. There has to be something that they're looking at. They, they allowed a witness that they shouldn't have allowed. They uh, allowed a piece of, uh, of evidence uh, to come out that shouldn't have come out because this had nothing to do, this was irrelevant. 
Um, a lot of times it has to do with looking at the person's past. Is that relevant in this case? Well, pro potentially not. But if the judge allows uh, evidence from the past to come forward, like uh, what, uh, what you did as a juvenile, uh, that cannot be presented in, 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 uh, in the court, in the case, because that may prejudice the jury. And if that happens, of course, then they can throw the, uh, uh, the case out uh, on appeals. If a verdict is in a criminal trial is overturned or reversed, the appeals court will either order a retrial or order charges thrown out. And usually that's what happens. Uh, so if they planted evidence or whatever, whatever happened, uh, potentially they can either retry the case or they can throw out select charges. You can't charge him with uh, criminal possession. Uh, he threw a bong out the window. Uh, you can't charge him with criminal possession because it was paraphernalia, it wasn't, it wasn't marijuana that he threw out there, it was paraphernalia. In a civil case, an appellate court uh, can let the decision stand, they can reverse it, uh, rule in favor of the side that lost, or they can make some uh, other changes in the decision and remand uh, or return the case to a lower court for reconsideration. And that's the, in the civil cases, that's what they do. And this is of course what uh, they're trying to do. This is how, how these cases are tied up in court. Of course, it's going to cost the person to maintain that lawyer for an extended length of time. But if you're somebody like uh, AT&T or Bell Telephone, uh, you've got all the lawyers in the world. And you've got them all on retainer, and you might as well use them. And that's, of course, what business moguls, what uh, real estate moguls would do. Somebody sues them to get paid for this. Well, if they get a decision, they just keep it, they keep filing, uh, refiling, and putting it back in appeals. This is one of the reasons why they rarely lose a case. Why? Because it, it never comes to, to an end. They just keep stringing it out so that they will never lose a case. Or they will settle. Video conferencing that permits uh, live two-way video and audio communication is one of the, uh, the uh, looks of the future. It's uh, something that we have, we're already seeing. Uh, if you've seen them on television, uh, somebody commits a crime in Albuquerque. And that, that's the only television I get to watch. Uh, somebody commits a crime in Albuquerque. We get to see them on video. Uh, uh, the video conferencing is actually what it is. Uh, so we get to see them being uh, arraigned uh, uh, by video. Uh, electronic and digital evidence, of course, will be something uh, in the future. Uh, we're already using uh, electronic and digital evidence, uh, telephone records and whatnot. Uh, this whole case about uh, the Russians hacking, uh, the uh, trying to hack uh, the uh, election of uh, 2016, uh, the question is, were they ever successful? Uh, they tried to hack into 29 states, were uh, potentially hacked, and of course there is no evidence that they were successful. Uh, but they are also trolling. In other words, they were, they were uh, presenting uh, negative things uh, with uh, all this electronic uh, information from Twitter and from uh, Facebook. Uh, so it, it, all of this is electronic and digital evidence that we have against the Russians. So it's going to be interesting to see how this thing plays out. Uh, was it yesterday that somebody threw Russian flags at Trump? Was it yesterday? Okay. <laughs> it's kind of interesting. <laughs> you can't throw things at the president, okay? <laughs> it's like attacking the president. That's a, that guy's going to go to jail for a while. Uh, computer animations and simulations uh, are, are uh, uh, waves of the future. Uh, virtual environment technologies uh, that allow observers to experience it and a recreation <coughs> of an event as if they were actually present when it occurred. And of course, this is a wave of the future. This is something that we will see. Uh, this is one of my favorite movies, Idiocracy. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie. <laughs> anyway, this is a clip from Idiocracy. This is when he goes to trial uh, in the future. I hope. There we go. Okay. Well, it's working here. It's not working there. Okay. All right, all right. Forget it. Okay, you don't get to see it, but it's the, the part where he uh, goes to trial and Everybody's so stupid, his lawyer 
burrito. Is that his? No, Nacho. Nacho is his lawyer. <laughs> and the judge is just an idiot. Anyway, that's the wave of the future. I can't wait. <coughs> what time is it? Oh, I got 10 minutes. Come on. Oh, there we go. Uh, that was chapter 8, so we're going to start chapter 9. Uh, let me take a look at it and see what it is. Alternatives to, to traditional prosecution. <clears throat> what is it? Ah, let's stop. What the hell? Let's take a couple extra minutes off. Do you guys mind? I'm cheating you out of 10 minutes of, of knowledge. Don't cry, Jeff. It's, it'll be okay. 